Hallo, liebe Hörer von Stay Forever. In der Vorbereitung auf unsere Folge zum Action-Adventure Flashback von 1992 sprach Gunnar mit dem Designer des Spiels, dem Franzosen Paul Cuisset. Und dieses kurze Interview veröffentlichen wir wie gewohnt als Teil unserer Materialsammlung. Flashback stammt von den französischen Delphine Studios und Paul Cusset war dort von Anfang an maßgeblich beteiligt. Vom ersten Spiel Bio Challenge von 1988 bis zum Ende der Firma 2004. Zur Zeit von Flashback war Paul der Kreativchef des Studios und als solcher federführend für das Spiel. Was genau das bedeutet, wie Flashback entstand und welche Herausforderungen das Team bewältigen musste, das erzählt er Gunnar im nun folgenden englischsprachigen Interview. Ich wünsche euch viel Spaß beim Hören. Ein Podcast über alte Spiele von zwei alten Männern. Stay Forever mit Gunnar Lott und Christian Schmidt. Hello, Paul. Hello. We'll be talking about Flashback. Can you describe in one to three sentences what type of game Flashback is in your own words? Flashback is an adventure action game. It's a platformer and uh, it was created in 1993 and uh, it was originally created for the Sega Mega Drive but was released on both Amiga and PCs at that time. You play the role of Conrad, a young agent of the GBI who has been captured and they erased his memory. So he's trying to find his memory back and discovers that there is an alien conspiracy that wants to conquer the solar system and he's, he will try to destroy the what is called master brain, the brain that controls all the aliens that are trying to invade the planet. Let us walk through how the game was developed. Could you move in your head to the point where you were when the idea came first about? So the company was called Delphine Software. It was a company based in Paris. My role at the company was creative director. We were approached by a company called US Gold, an English company. They had the license of the movie The Godfather. And so they wanted us to think about a game adaptation of the movie. So uh, I started thinking about this, and they also proposed us to work on a new console that would be really soon, the Sega Mega Drive. At Delphine, we used to work on adventure games, uh, point-and-click adventure games, like Future Worlds or Operation Stealth. So the move to console was really interesting. I proposed to shift the story into the future, because it was the time of sci-fi movies like Blade Runner, Terminator, and uh, and was a big fan of these movies. And they said, okay, uh, let's have a try. It can be interesting. <laughs> we started to work on the animations and the technique that we would be using for the whole game, which is the rotoscoping. We are filming a character, and then we draw over with a paint program. And after about six, seven months, maybe a little more, We had the first demo, the first level of flashback, more or less. So we went to them and showed the game. And uh, they just stared at it. <laughs> it was very far from the license. So they told us, okay, it's not possible for us to continue with that license. But we love the game. It seems really interesting. So you're free to go on your own and do the game that you want. Do you know why US Gold approached you? Did they want to have an adventure game like the game Cruise for a Corpse or the other games you mentioned, Future Wars? Yes. Or did they already know about another world that wasn't out there? No, we used to work with them, you know, on previous games. We released Cruise for a Corpse for them. So I think they thought that it would be interesting because we used to do something that could match the franchise of The Godfather. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that was the reason why they proposed us to work on this. Did they expect you to make an adventure game? No, because it was a console game, so we would not have the same interfaces and it couldn't be a point-and-click game. So I told them that it would be a more action-oriented game. They knew about that. 
It's just that the shift into the future was so far that you just couldn't match. But the idea at the beginning was that you have these mafias in the future and... Uh, I think uh, the story could be transposed, but of course the universe and the art direction could not be the same. Mm. So we just went very far from the original <laughs> idea. Did they pay you for this first milestone? Yeah, they paid us and they continued to work with us. We released the game together as a co-production. Ah, okay, so they were still involved. Yeah, and you know, they found the title. You know, I, I think today uh, something like that would be very difficult. Mm. But at that time, it was just, okay, no, it doesn't fit. No problem. Let's continue. You have a cool game. <laughs> you want to have it. So no mm. problem. <laughs> so you're totally free now. What do you do next? It was quite a challenging uh, project because we had a lot of animations and a lot of frames. And uh, the console was limited in memory. So we had to develop a lot of things to be able to compress everything. Flashback was one of the first games that would be using the 24 megabits of memory. At that time, the cartridge were limited to 16 megabits. And Sega said to us, okay, we'll have the 24 megabits, but you'll have to wait several months. And uh, we just couldn't wait for that. So we retro-engineered the cartridge itself and we built our own board. So we were able to have a 24 megabits cartridge. I think they were quite <laughs> amazed when we sent them a demo with a 24 megabit cartridge that we made ourselves. <laughs> so we had to face a lot of challenges. You know, I wanted to keep the adventure aspect. So we put in the inventory and the cutscenes in order to tell the story. And it was a fairly creative approach because we did not have a lot of examples of how the game could be so we had to invent our own standards that's why the mapping of the control is a bit strange maybe for today's players because they don't fit the standards where for instance you press a button to jump in flashback it's different because you had different jumps and so we had to map the different movements in some specific ways and It was just experimenting. This was your first console game. So did you look at other Mega Drive games in order to have some inspiration about how things could be done there and how the controls would work? We started before the console was released in France. So we just didn't have any references. The manual of the console itself was basically a big book with all the registries and registers and explanation about what they do. But, you know, it was very difficult to understand how the machine was working because it was so different than the computers, the Atari and Amigas we used to work on. So we had to experiment a lot to understand how to do things. Did you have a Japanese version of the console or did you have some kind of dev kit? Yeah, we had a dev kit. It was a kind of console and was attached to a PC. Of course, we didn't have a C compiler. At the time, Delphine, we were using C, but we didn't have any compiler, so we had to write all the game in assembly machine language. The game editor was created on Amiga. At that time, at Delphine, we had Amiga 3000, quite like the PC machine, you know, with the hard drive, and it was a very effective machine. So we did all the editing on the Amiga animations and the scripting and so on and we wrote a player for the mega drive and that was written in assembly language yeah the environment was quite difficult to use for instance when we wanted to create a version of the game for testers or for publishers and so on we had to write the eproms and uh, that took time and uh, when something fails on you you want to reuse the eproms you have to erase them with ultraviolet light <laughs> it takes quite, <laughs> quite a lot of time. <laughs> so uh, it was a very interesting experience. So because you did part of the development work on the Amiga, this enabled you to put out the game as an Amiga game first before it came out on the Mega Drive. Yeah, just a matter of timing because we had to submit the game to Sega and we had to wait until the cartridge are printed. That took about three or four months so in the meantime, we finished the Amiga version and we were able to release the Amiga version before the game came out on Mega Drive. But in fact, it was finished first on the Mega Drive. 
When you look at the credits of the game, you wore many hats during development. You are credited with story, with programming, with sound effects, with video effects, and of course, with overall direction. How did you go about developing the game and how was your workday? Could you describe a typical workday? <laughs> did you just switch <laughs> from video editing to programming to direction? The game took around two years to develop, so I had the time to switch. <laughs> At the beginning, when we started the project, I began to write the engine. So the tools on the Amiga and the animation system. And then after that, we had new programmers coming into the team and some of them began to write the console version. So I switched to the level design and the story. The story was quite fast to write, but I did all the level design. With the Amiga, I wrote you know, a tool where I could sketch very quickly how the game would behave and the design. So I was able to draw the collision maps, have the character and the enemies playing together. So we did a lot of iterations on the gameplay before the artist came in. I also worked on the sounds because I chose the sound effects and placing them and uh, for the video also. You know, it was a small team. Um, For that time, it was a, not a small team, but uh, we were nine or ten people working on the project. So everybody was doing a lot of things. It was just not possible to have just one job in the team. I just had to switch from one thing to another. Also because we, we used to work like that. I started working in video games and we were two people one artist and one programmer. So I took the habit to do a lot of things and I like to control everything myself, so this was not an exception on Flashback. Who worked with you in this team, and how was the situation in the team? Did you have, like, in a modern games company, you know, like one big room and everybody is working at their workstations, or did you have small office spaces? Yeah, we had a small office space. It was not very big. I think it was something like 35 square meters. We had some artists with us, programmers, and uh, the sound design was done in the Delphine Studios because we had the chance at the time, you know, to be a part of the Delphine Group, which was at the beginning a record company. So there were studios that we could use and uh, sound engineers and musicians that worked with us. But for the game itself, we were, I think, 10 people, four or five programmers, and the rest are artists. The main technology was to capture all the frames for the animation, and for that we used to film some artist, some guy who would do the move. And at that time, we, we did not have the possibility to hire actors or mock-up studios and so on. It was not existing. So when we needed a move, just asking someone if he wants to do the move, and we went out with a small camera and just film him doing the moves. And then the artist had a tape machine because at that time there was tapes and we used transparent papers that you put on the screen and then draw the frame one by one, posing the video, drawing the frame, going to next frame, drawing next frame. And then all these transparent were used on the Amiga to draw over with the program that was called Deluxe Paint. They put the transparent paper on the screen and then just drawing inside. <laughs> That really took a lot of time, but the result was so great for that time. I knew that there would be a, a lot of problems because it wasn't possible to have so many frames for the animation because it's not only the main characters, it's also the enemies and everything was done like this. So um, you just had to develop a lot of background code to decompress everything in real time and uh, being able to have that kind of animations And you did choose the art style. Was this in collaboration? Because obviously Eric Shahid did something similar about at the same time. Was this like, you like that? Or was this a Delphine thing? Because it doesn't come as a natural choice for a game for the Mega Drive. We wanted to do something different because, you know, the Japanese games at that time were on the opposite side. Basically, they used big sprites and a few frames of animation. We wanted to do something different. The first thing we wanted to try was the animation, and Eric did it also with rotoscoping. Prince of Persia before did it too. 
and we were a fan of the two games. So I think it came quite logically, and we did some experiment ourselves. And when the artist showed me the result, I was so amazed that I knew that we had to sacrifice everything for that animation. <laughs> It was very obvious that that would be the difference. Because, as I told you, we started the project as a license for a film. So the idea also was to do something like a movie. Basically, we wanted to have something that was more cinematic. And also, we wanted to tell a story. So we put in the different elements that could be used to tell the story. So the inventory, the character, the ability to talk to people and so on. Even the design of the game and the levels are story-driven. One thing that intrigued me is Delphine being a record company also. I visited Delphine in the early 2000s and I had to walk through the record company to go to the development team. And there was Golden Records, Platinum Records by Richard Kleidermann (laughs) on the walls. Was it like that in the 90s and 80s too? Yeah, it was the same the president of the company was Paul de Senville. We worked with him very tightly. So, in fact, they started the company because one of the friend of Paul, uh, which is uh, Jean Baudelot, is uh, the guy who composed the music for the game. Uh, he was fan of video games and uh, of the music at the time that you could make on the Amiga, you know, with the sound trackers. And he wanted to create music for this, and uh, that's how the company started. <laughs> it's a quite a peculiar way to start a video games company coming from the music side. When the game came out in 1992, it was relatively seldom that flip screen games came out still. So single screen games where you had no scrolling because in 1985 when Super Mario Brothers came about, so everybody was like, oh, side scrollers are the new thing. We have to, oh, we have to make side scrollers. Why did you choose to have the fixed screen? It was uh, mainly a technical problem because, as explained, we had to decompress everything. And we also wanted to have much more detailed art in the backgrounds. So we chose to have fixed screens just because it was very complex to have a big environment that would scroll. And we were using so much horsepower to decompress the animation frames and that was not possible to do the same with, with the backgrounds. And uh, we saw that Prince of Persia could do it, so... <laughs> so it's an artistic choice and not a gameplay choice. Uh, it's more a technical choice than mm. a gameplay <laughs> choice. But, <laughs> in fact, yeah. <laughs> so now we're 20 years later and the game is still very much loved by lots of people. And you've started to revisit this in the 2010s. And right now, just shortly before we're conducting this interview, you have released two new versions of Flashback. That's the Android and the iOS version, so for mobile devices. Do you think that the game is well suited for mobile devices? No, it was quite a challenge to port it to mobile device because it was intended to be played with a gamepad. So using the touch screen is something quite uh, different, but I like challenges. And I think it was interesting as a game design exercise to make the switch. But of course, it does support the gamepad. So if you have a Bluetooth gamepad, you can play with it. You have also a virtual stick mode. And we added a new mode, which is the touch mode, where the gameplay is different. And also added some improvements because a lot of people at the beginning of Blashback can be lost. There is no indication of what to do and where to go. So I added objectives and tutorials and so on. Also the rewind function. If you die, you can just use the rewind and uh, go back in time several seconds and restart from that moment just before you die. There's quite a lot of changes, but the thing important is that all of these changes can be disconnected if you want. So you can play the original version if you want when I tried to play the game as a gamer some years ago, because I just, you know, forgot completely how to play the game, it was quite frustrating sometimes because it's very punishing. So I had the idea to put this kind of functionality. If you die, you just rewind. Of course, it, it makes the game a little bit easier, but it's not bad to remove the frustration when you die. So that's about it. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you very much to you too.